So Daniel also commented saying that with perseverance arriving on Mars, uh, could it eventually develop consciousness? Because we're using its senses to see and hear. Could we have been sent to Earth with a set of senses and our creators are watching us to see, do, hear, smell, and feel? <laughs> yeah, no, well, all sorts of uh, things can see, hear, smell, and feel. All those are just sensors, right? Now, the human avatar has a lot of sensors also. You know, your eyeball is a sensor. You, uh, your fingertips are sensors. So we are, you can think of a human as a sensor platform with lots of sensors. And indeed, this virtual reality was sort of designed for us so that we could uh, come here and make good choices and grow up. So if you want to say that uh, you know, the creator watches its creations, you know, go through the maze called physical reality, well, yeah, that's true in, in that sense. Well, is a Mose River going to become conscious? Probably not. Probably doesn't make a lot of moral choices. Or at least not enough of them that a consciousness would want to, you know, take over that avatar. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Andrew. Um, oh, hello, Tom and everybody. Um, first of all, thanks very much for this, um, this q and I mean, I get a certain satisfaction when I'm working on the website and I produce something and it looks really good and so forth. And so there's, there's reward there, but these Q and A's are a lovely bonus on top of all of that. So thank you very much for that. Well, you're welcome. Um, my question is around the safety of the COVID vaccine because of the speed of its development, the fact that they're using um, messenger RNA, which is a, an untried new deck technology and, and we're now hearing about how there are vaccine injuries, including some deaths. Um, it's sort of like the cure is worse than the disease. And I wanted to know, can we use our, our conscious intent to mitigate the bad effects of the vaccine if we're required to take it? Yes, absolutely, we can. And um, I have gotten uh, the vaccine, but two shots. I had the uh, uh, Pfizer version, which you get a shot, and then like two weeks later, you get another one. And uh, I did some, some research on the vaccines, because early on, yes, I wanted to know, you know, hey, these things are coming along awfully fast, you know, often it's 10 years to get a vaccine out. And now this is coming along quick. So I did some research into why that is like that. And I found out that the, the, this vaccine, the new vaccines that are coming out, are just as well, if not a little better, researched than the ones that took the 10 years. And the reason for that is the thing that takes so long in researching a vaccine are what they call the clinical trials. You know, they put it out there and see how well does it work. Well, in order to have really good statistics, you know, something you're going to give to hundreds of millions of people, you, you can't just give that to 10 and think you've got an answer. You know, you got to give it to a lot of people. So they end up at a minimum looking for 10, 20,000 people in the group that got the vaccine and an equal 10 or 20,000 people in the control group that didn't get the vaccine and see what the difference is between those. And that's the long pole in the tent. That's the thing that, that holds them up and takes so much time for them to accumulate that data because it is unethical to go out and, and uh, give people a disease. So what they do is they give it to people, two groups, large numbers, and just let those people go out and live their life and see how many of them end up with the disease. And if the ones that didn't get it have this many people got the disease and the, the group that got the vaccine, they only have that many that got the disease. And if you do that over 20,000 people, then you've got some statistics that tell you how good it is. Well, that takes a long, long time. But with COVID, there were so many people getting it that it didn't take long at all. And the research that they did in COVID had 50,000 people in each group because you could just give it to a whole lot of people. And a lot of those people ended up getting exposed to a disease because it was a pandemic. And that way they had 50,000 people and it only took you know, months 
to have that many people in a group. So you, you know, after two or three months, you could look at your group of 50,000 people that had the vaccine and 50,000 that didn't, and you could immediately see the differences in those groups of how many of them got sick. Okay. So that was the thing. And that's what takes 10 years to do normally here. It didn't take that much because there were so many people getting the disease and, and that was consistent over so much time that uh, it was easy to do this time. And though, that, though the, the technique they're using is a, a new technique, it's a very powerful one that, that seems to work well. Now, the, the one I got, Pfizer, is the one I followed because that's the one I ended up getting. So I tended to do my research on that one. And, uh, you know, when they do those trials with the placebo, you know, group that didn't get it, uh, they found a, a very high statistical uh, significance. They were like 97, 98% protection over those groups of people. Well, that's a lot. The flu vaccine that goes around year after year where people go get the flu vaccine, if they get like 65 or 70%, it's a go. They put those out because that's still a whole lot better than, than nothing. You know, that, that helps a lot. But uh, so this one was so much better in that trial. Now, you're always going to have some people who are going to be hurt by a vaccine, no matter what it is. And that's because they give it to so many people. You know, if you give anything to, what, 500 million people, you're going to have, you know, if you give a, you know, a glass of water to 500 million people, there's going to be some of them that are going to choke on it. And when they choke on it, they're going to have a heart attack afterwards, you know, because they got so worked up trying to breathe. You know, it, you give it to that many people and it would be, you know, it's just, unreasonable to think that 500 million people are going to take it and nobody's going to have an adverse reaction. You're going to have allergies. You're going to have people who just, you know, got it at a bad time and their immune system was not ready, not ready to deal with it. So it didn't work very well. You just that many people, there's so many variables that there's no way that you can not. So yes, it is going to hurt a few people and all the vaccines we get are like that. You know, they do hurt people. And they get a real bad reputation because, you know, those cases kind of stand out. Oh, they took the vaccine and got hurt. But if you look at the, the hundreds of millions of people that got it, then the, the risk is in the, you know, one in, one in a million or one in 100,000 or one in, you know, 50,000, which is better than driving an automobile, better yeah, than, safer than crossing, the, crossing the road. Yeah, safer than crossing the road. Exactly. So yeah, there are risks in it. Um, everybody reacts a little differently to it. You know, our biology is so different. I mean, we kind of seem like we're the same. You know, we're human beings, but our, our biology is so different. Like uh, a friend of mine got the same vaccine I got. And the very first one they got, they had this terrible sore arm that lasted for you know a week. And then when they got the second one, they got chills and headaches and all kinds of things. Well, when I got mine, I had a, an arm that was barely sore. I've had mosquito bites that were worse. And in an hour, it was gone. And the second one, I didn't even get a sore arm. You know, so it just depends. And I'm sure somebody else, you know, will, will have a, a, a much worse reaction. So you just don't know. But the odds are very much in your favor. So my personal recommendation is go get the vaccine because it will, it's a very low probability that the vaccine will hurt you and a very high probability based on their, their, their uh, trials, their clinical trials, that it will keep you from, from getting ill. Now, the thing is you can still get the disease. It's just that you don't get sick from it. In other words, you've gotten your shots you get around somebody who has a disease, yes, your body can take those, those uh, you know, microbes on, 
and they can grow in your body, but then your immune system knows exactly what to do to clobber them, and your immune system does clobber them, so it goes away. So during that little bit of time where you have it, you could actually give it to another person, but you're not going to get sick because your immune system is going to take care of it, but you could pass it on to somebody else. So when I go out, I still put my mask on because it's possible. Now, the probability is a lot less, you know, because my immune system is going to get right on that. When I get it, it's probably going to squish it very quickly, but I do that anyway. It's just one it makes other people feel better if I've got a mask on because they don't know that I've had two shots and that I'm unlikely to, to have it. They don't know that. And, you know, they don't, they can't have people out checking, you know, show me your card to prove that you got the shots. Well, as soon as you do that, somebody will find a way to falsify those cards, you know, so that they look like they've gotten the shots when they haven't. So it's better just to put on a mask and not have to deal with all of that. So I, I wear a mask, even though I've, I've had the shots, but um, I, I, uh, I signed up as soon as possible to get the shot because I knew there was going to be a long line. Right. And my research told me that it was a really good thing to do because I'm 76 and the downside is a lot steeper for me than it would be for you because uh, you're not that old yet. <laughs> so it- uh, I'm getting there. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. um, it's good to hear. I mean, as like you, I've been trying to do my research, but it's been very, um, so much disinformation out there. It's get very hard. And I yes. really understand statistics, but I've been finding it very hard to find to, so I can, I can go to the VARS website and I can see all those bad statistics, but I don't have a, a reference number of, you know, is that 1%, is it 0.1% or is it point naught 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 one percent not, 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 not 1% yeah. that, are, that are having the injuries? And yeah, here in New Zealand, fun. we have the Pfizer vaccine. So um, mm -hmm. it sounds like we're on a good course here. Yeah, I think that's a good you. course. I think the other ones, although they don't have quite as, as uh, you know, they're not quite as effective, but still they're effective enough to be a really good vaccine. So any of the vaccines you get are probably much better than not getting one. Um, but I think Pfizer is the leader so far as, as far as in the results from the statistics from the trials that they took. And these trials are so much better than than's almost been done with any illness before this because they have so many, you know, such large groups. Right. Groups of 50,000 are almost unheard of because it takes too long to gather that much data when you only get a couple of, you know, a trickle of people, you know, a few people, you know, every week trickle into your group. It takes a long time to get 10, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 people. So yeah, that, yeah, there's just lots and lots of misinformation. I, I found the, uh, I went to John Hopkins University, which is a major university here in the US. And they have a very strong uh, reputation in public health and in uh, immunology and that sort of thing. So I went there and looked at, at them because they don't make vaccines. They don't have a, you know, they don't have a, a uh, what's a the conflict word? Of interest. Yeah, they don't have a conflict of interest. They just are smart people. A lot of people who do study these, these things and they have a, they put up a website and I got a lot of information there. And that website led me to other websites. You know, you kind of get into that area and then you move around and after spending probably six or seven hours of doing research, I had a feeling that I got the, you know, I had the right answers from the right people who knew. These people weren't selling anything. And, you know, I talk science pretty well because I'm a scientist too. So I could understand their statistics and, and their tests and the things that they were doing pretty easily. And I looked at their charts. And so you can get good information, but you have to dig for it. It's yeah. Whereas the misinformation, you don't have to dig for that. <laughs> That's everywhere. But, you know, the reason we get all that inf misinformation is that we are very predisposed to the negative. And that's, that's why, uh, you know, almost all news is bad news. You know, if you go watch the nightly news, they don't tell you about somebody who really, you know, something wonderful happened to them. Or if they do... It's just something they toss in to try to counter all the negativity. You know, it's about all the terrible things that are happening in the world. 
Well, part of that's just our, our uh, hard wiring. We are more interested in things that can hurt us than we are on things that can't. So when somebody gets shot or somebody gets run over or there's a war someplace, we immediately focus on the negative. Oh, what's going on there? What might that have to do with me? How can I avoid that kind of a problem? Whereas happy things are nice, but they don't grab our attention like negative things. So that's one thing. And secondly, there's lots and lots of fear in the land. You know, people are up to their eyebrows in fear. And when you are up to your eyebrows in fear, you see scary things everywhere. You imagine all the worst things that could possibly happen. You live in a very negative kind of a, a dark place. And, you know, if somebody just, you know, makes a, a, a new, uh, you know, what, a new way to get rid of a, of a, of a virus, well, if you are a fearful person, your immediate thought is, what's wrong with it? How is this going to hurt me? You see, because just because you're negative, you're, you're a fearful person. That's the way you think. So we have a huge bias toward the negative. So you will see, you know, 10,000 things will come up on the internet that are fear-based for every one that comes up that's not. And that's just because we are who we are. And part of it's our hardwiring and part of it's our, our bias toward being negative. Because once you have fear, it's much easier to get some more fear. One fear makes the next fear easier to swallow and easier to believe. And we live in times where fear is being peddled, you know, it's pushed at us, trying to manipulate us. That's how you manipulate people, so through their fears. That's how you get them to buy your products, you know. All your marketers you play on people's fears. That's how you get them to come to your church. You know, you're the hell and damnation if they don't. Uh, you know, it's fear. That's how you get them to obey the law because we're going to grab you and throw you in jail if you don't. Fear. So everybody who would like to manipulate us knows that fear is the big handle on our back that lets you know us be manipulated. And now that we have mass media like internet, and, you know, TV and that sort of thing, well. Uh, those who would like to manipulate us can spread that fear over hundreds of millions of people, you know, per minute. And they've never been able to do that before. And like I say, the more fearful you are, the more scary things you see, the more you interpret the data you get to be fearful. You know, very fearful people end up finding monsters when they go out of body. It's just the way it is. You know, it's a, uh, Fear is the thing that tends to accentuate more fear. So it's, it's just that way. You're going to always find many, many negative things and fearful things. That, you know, and you, you'll have to really dig to find the actual information. So right. I suggest that everybody just turn off the TV and stop, stop listening to all that fearful stuff. You'll be a happier person if you uh, if you ignore it. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your answer. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. So, Tom, I watched a, a very interesting video the other day that explained how the logistics map is a part of Mandelbrot set and how feigenbaums constant relate to bifurcation diagram and so on, and how this constant is found in the best area of things in nature. And I wondered, well, what's your take on that? So can you speak a little on how this math mathematical concepts, Mulder-Broad set and logistics map relate to evolution of uh, larger consciousness system, maybe databases and possibilities, future possible da databases. Um, mm -hmm. If there is any possibility of uh, significant connection between them, of course. Yes, there is a there is a connection, and that is that this is a computed reality. When it's a computed reality, 
of course, there has to be something that, that is the backbone of that that tells you what can be computed and what can't, what should be computed and what shouldn't. And that's the rule set. So we have a rule set and then our reality is computed. <clears throat> the system is going to find ways to make that computation more efficient. And as most animators have found out in the last decade or so, using fractals makes animation much more efficient. Well, basically what the system's doing when it's creating this virtual reality is making a, an animation, if you will. It's making a, 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 a virtual uh, reality for us. So it's going to use those kinds of math that make that process most efficient. And when you have something that works well, for one thing, it often works well for other things as well. Like for a while when uh, people were using objects to make up, you know, simple objects to make up more complex objects. So they would take uh, ellipsoids and rectangles and other things like that, just simple shapes, and they'd build up other things out of it. They could make airplanes and people and all sorts of things just by combining those basic shapes together. And then they come up with vector graphics, which means they could draw mathematics and the vectors would trace the lines. And then they came up with fractal mathematics that allows them to make scenery and natural things much more easily than actually having to specify each, each bit or each pixel, you know, it, it uh, kind of generates on the fly. So yes, fractal math is something that's very powerful. Uh, it has many, you know, I should put it this way, many things in nature look like they, uh, have a very strong connection to fractal mathematics. Particularly, we can see, you know, symmetries in seashells and even coastlines. You know, if you go up and look at the coastline of uh, any any place, you know, you can see that that coastline fits very nicely, you know, with fractal mathematics. So yes, in a virtual reality, you expect a math-based uh, rendering engine that renders the virtual reality. So that's really the connection. <clears throat> it's not so much that Mandel brought, that's just one set of, of fractals that it's called the Mandelbrot set named after the mathematician that first recognized that. <clears throat> but there's lots of others as well. And each set, you know, some look like clouds, some look like tree bark, some look like, uh, you know, waves on the ocean, some look like uh, mountains, <clears throat> and they can, they can make fractals that represent all sorts of things, that, that shapes that you find in the natural world. So that's the, that's the connection. This is a math-based uh, simulation, as all virtual realities are. Our virtual reality is, is a little more like the... Uh, like no man's sky where you only send data to those people who are asking for it and you make up everything on the fly as you go. It's a very efficient way. And here you have no man's sky, which had quintillions of whole planets, each with its own fauna and, and animal and plant life. And that whole thing was done like by four or five people on a relatively small computer. You know, it didn't take a supercomputer to do that because it's that much more efficient way of doing it than sitting down and, and having to pixel by pixel make something. That's, that takes a huge amount of processing to do that. <clears throat> so I don't know, uh, Georgie, whether that uh, answers what your question was or not, but there's a lot of yes, math. Yes, There's a lot of math involved in in our in our world. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you know, and the reason that <clears throat> that math is such a good fit for our world is that if you 
if you think about our reality, you'll see that most of our reality can be described in terms of quantity, in terms of how many. And mathematics, arithmetic, algebra, calculus, all of that is the logic of quantity. That's what basic, basic math is. It's the logic of quantity. So quantity has its own logic. And uh, our world is mostly described in terms of quantity. You know, if you just think about it, if you're going to make the picture, you're going to describe our world, it's all about quantity. So math is the natural logic to use to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, now, Mario, you're up. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, good Hi, to Mario. see some, some known faces around. <laughs> Uh, I have a question, of course, <laughs> I listen for it. Uh, it's about the metaphor you frequently use about this being a basic school or a learning lab mm -hmm. and a fast track to for, for consciousness to develop, for young consciousness to develop. Uh, uh, it, it leads us to, to think about that there might be some other environments that, that would be for, for higher uh, learning, for example, okay, uh, uh, it makes sense to think that if this is a basic school, then there are there might be higher grade schools all around in, in any other PMR or any other environment. Could you uh, go a little bit further on that, on, on how does this work if we migrate from, from one level to another? I, I'm not in a hurry, I know that is still a long time, but just, just to get to it. Because this is a question that comes to mind when, when you use that metaphor, okay? Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Um, well, what our virtual reality, we call the physical universe, is more like the old time schools. And in the old time schools, all the grades were all in one schoolhouse. And the older kids helped the younger kids. You know, that was the way school worked. So there might be, that's because there weren't very many teachers around. So if you had a teacher, well, then everybody that wanted an education from adult down to, you know, five and six year olds all went to that school. So th that is more of the way our schoolhouse is. It's, it's for all grades and the older kids, the ones that have evolved more, help the younger ones that are, that are trying to evolve in pretty much the same way. Now, there are other virtual realities that, are, that appear physical like this one, you know, real strong rule sets. And you can go to these other realities if you really don't want to come to this one. That's a choice that you have. Most people come back to this one and there's a couple of reasons. One, just have it. You get to know it. You get to learn the way the works, the way the rule set is, you know, the way things happen here. And it's just easier. You immediately kind of fit in and, and already know the ropes. You go to a new place and the rule set's going to be a little different. Soci you know, the, the psychology and sociology is going to be different. Everything's going to be a little different and it takes a little more time to fit into that. So that's one reason people keep coming back here. But another one is, and this is just from my own experience of going to various of these, is this is the one we're in. It's really a very good one. It's a pretty good balance here of opportunity for growth. And particularly right now, we're coming to a period where we may be able to take some bigger steps instead of this incremental, you know, grow up by a tiny little bit, you know, every every uh, decade or so, like we have been doing for most of the 200,000 years that we've, we've been homo sapiens, it looks like in, in the uh, future, we can take some much bigger steps in growing up to where we make more progress, say, in, the, in uh, the next two or three decades than we may have made in the last, uh, you know, 190,000 years. 
So that would be good. So this is a good time to be in this particular virtual reality because the, the, the growth is, is starting to become possible to accelerate. See, when you're in a, if you were back, say, 500 years or 1,000 years ago, things didn't change much. You know, you had the warlord uh, mentality as far as social organization, and that pretty much reigned supreme from, you know, cavemen all the way to about 500 years ago. You know, that was the warlord mentality was basically the way we organize social systems. And when you have that, it's a, it's a much slower progress. Things don't change on a big scale very much. Most of the growth is limited to individuals who, even in spite of the system, grow up anyway you know, and become very evolved, you know, like uh, those who often end up having religions started in their name, you know, people who, who uh, evolve a lot even though the environment they're in is not very encouraging, you know, for that growth. So you kind of get the superstars. But here, we're getting more to where lots of people are going to grow up and grow up more quickly. So this is a, a good time to be here. So that's another reason people keep coming back. This has been building now uh, I just kind of randomly say the last 500 years, but we've been building toward the situation steadily. And a lot of the entities come here because they're a part of this, this wave, this thing that we, that we seem to be making progress much quicker than we did before. So that's one thing about the, about the schoolhouse. There are some places I've been that were more genteel, less, uh, less violent, more grown up, but I would say that they did not have as many opportunities. Now you get in an environment where most everybody's grown up and the challenges are hard to come by. Everybody's polite, everybody's nice to you. Even if you have buttons, nobody pushes them. You see, whereas here, if you've got buttons, that means you've got ego and you've got fear. And all you have to do is have a button and somebody is going to find it and just jab it just to see you hop and jump because that's fun. So here you have challenges all the time. It's a very challenging place to be. When you get to places that are a lot more grown up on the average, the challenges are a little harder to come by. You have to, you have to look for challenges. Here they come swarming out of the you know out, out of the corners and out of the dark places and and grab you. So this is a good place, good place to be. There are more genteel places, but I don't know that the evolution is any quicker there. Then it also means that it's possible that the whole environment improves. I mean. For, for everyone, because if it was just a, a one step to go here, it would always maintain the same step for everyone that needs that step. Mm -hmm. And if we have more different steps around, we can evolve and then uh, uh, the environment can grow too. Okay. That, yes. that, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Everything can grow up, grow up together. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, over to Daniel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, hear you very well, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, uh, nice to meet you, Tom. I hope you're doing well. Uh, my question is about overcoming fear and anxiety. I, uh, I hope I can give a little context because you've been asked so many times about this and I've been very uh, put attention to that a lot, but maybe if I give a little context, it will bring a different angle and it can be helped to others. Mm -hmm. So uh, here I go because I was <laughs> I was working on this since yesterday and because I'm kind of nervous also because it's the first time I make you a question. So <laughs> here I go. Uh, back in November last year, I remember clearly 
being in a very good emotional zone to the point I would go to sleep and stretch like a cat, amazed of how good I was feeling. And I will feel very grateful to life and would say thanks with all my heart because after all, it, has an, it hasn't always been like this. And I remember thinking, I'm enjoying these beautiful times as much as I can before new challenges may come. Then it came December and my emotional state got triggered and I was surprised that I started feeling anxiety and, I was, and it wasn't going away. After all, I hadn't, I hadn't felt it in more than 15 years. Actually, actually, I thought I was over those feelings that I worked so hard to get rid of back then. Then also to add it, this February, my six year old relationship came to an end. And even though the reasons had nothing to do with my anxiety situation, I couldn't help thinking, oh my God, this is going to get really challenging and it has been. So since December, I've been applying myself as seriously as I can to overcome, overcome fear and accept what I have to accept in order to move forward. My question is, doing the effort of catching myself when being, when being anxious or negative and stopping and really meaning not wanting to be that way, is this the best approach to get rid of fear and negativity and break out of this cycle? Yes, <clears throat> indeed, that is the best way. When you have a, a serious uh, intent that you don't want to be that way, then you will just, because of that intent, you'll catch yourself when you, are, when you start acting that way. And when you catch yourself, you can, you can look at, well, why? Why am I headed down that path? Why am I starting to get anxious? What's the... What's the driver here? What's pushing me in that direction? Because when you catch it just as it's happening, then you can ask those kinds of questions and you can get answers. Whereas if you don't catch it as it's happening, it's a little harder to, to see what's going on. So you get those answers and you get some understanding of where that anxiety is coming from. What's the fear that's doing that? And where did that fear come from? What's the source of that fear? Because just, you know, five months ago, you didn't have it. And now you have it. Well, did you always have it? And it just never surfaced? Or was it something new that you got for some reason? You know, these are good questions that you should be asking yourself as you, as you uh, try to understand your fear. Now, it's not necessary that you understand everything about your fear. You know, sometimes it's hard to get, you know, to figure out what the root of a fear is sometimes. But typically, if you spend some weeks or months on it, you can, you can find out what it is. And that can be helpful because these fears are almost always just smoke. They're beliefs of ours. They're things we believe. And we believe them at a very deep level, often comes from our childhood. And who knows, you know, you may have had a, a fear all along that you just weren't dealing with. It was maybe stuffed under the rug someplace where you couldn't see it. And as you get older and as you grow, you know, the things that were pushed where you couldn't see them suddenly can pop up and be right there in front of you. That happens a lot. As people get older, it's harder and harder to ignore and deny those fears. It's uh, you know, part of maturing that when you're a teenager, you still have a lot of fears, all sorts of anxieties, but you just stuff it under the rug and you go on with life. And as far as you know, you really don't have any problems. You don't get anxious. You just go and grab hold of life and and play with it and work with it, and it works for you. Well, all those fears are, are buried, and they're buried out of sight, out of mind, like you don't even know you have them. They're still influencing your choices. Even when you're a teenager, they're influencing your choices, but they do it without your knowledge, without you knowing about it. You get older, and that doesn't work anymore. They're there. 
they're obvious and they pick at you. Whereas before you could kind of push them down and say, leave me alone. And they would, as you get older, they start to pick, pick, pick at you saying, you know, uh, you need to deal with this. You need to deal with this. Well, that's the point of being here. We do need to deal with those things. That's, that's why we're here. That's why it works that way. The more mature we get, the more capable we are dealing with them and they start to rise up and, 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 uh, interfere with our lives. So all that's pretty normal, you know, that, that you're, that you're finding it working that way. That's, that's the way it, it happens. Um, but yes, you're doing the right thing. Look at the fear. You will find it probably goes way back. You've probably been covering it up all along. It's now come out to where you are being forced to deal with it or it's going to interfere with your life. And it's difficult now for you to just push it away because it keeps coming back if you do that. Well, that means it's time to get rid of it. <laughs> this is the time, now's the opportunity. So, so could, it be, could it be that because it's the way I was watching at the, watching at how it came, it seems like or, or at least I want to think like, maybe I'm ready to, even, even though it's hard, maybe I'm ready to, to face this thing. Yes, so that's that why, yes. Motivation because I think I might be ready, but it does feel very difficult. So it, it yeah, makes sense what Yeah, the reason you're getting it is because you're ready. You know, as we get older, we, we're more ready to deal with those things. And now's the time. And if you fail to deal with it now, it'll just get worse. It'll, it'll, it'll affect your life more and more and more. So it's best to get rid of it because if, it, if you don't, five years from now, it will be picking at you much harder. It'll be even worse. So you have to realize, okay, this is a lesson and I'm, I'm capable, I can deal with it now and I will deal with it now. It may take some years to get over a fear that's deep. I say you don't have to find it, find its origin. Could be helpful, but not necessary. All you have to do is have the strong intent that you don't want to be that way and keep focus on that. And when you catch yourself being that way, it's you just have to stop and say, no, all right, I'm starting to feel angry. I'm starting to feel upset and anxious. No, I'm not going to be that way. Take a deep breath. Let's do a little meditation here. <laughs> Let let all that anxiety go. All right, everything's all right. You know, you have to do that and then go back to whatever it was you're doing in a better state of mind and just keep doing that. And eventually it'll get to the point that it'll, it'll just go away. It'll get a, a smaller and smaller thing and uh, it'll disappear. But it, it won't disappear in a week. You know, it's gonna, it's, these take, months, if not years. Some people work on them for decades. It just depends on how much effort you put toward it, how long it'll take. But it's a work of a lifetime. So it'll take as long as it takes, is the attitude. You know, I'll work on this till I get it. Okay. And the more you focus on it, the faster it'll go. But just keep pushing at it and be yeah. patient. Whatever time it takes, just continue. Yes, just keep working on it. And as you, as you feel yourself becoming more you know, anxious, that anxiety comes up and you're feeling insecure or something, then you know, stop. Get out of that mindset. Take a break. Meditate. Take a walk. Go look out the window. Uh, you know, put on a piece of music that you like that particularly you know, makes you feel good. Just do something else. Don't go there. Don't act that out. Don't, don't progress through it. Stop it and have this intent. I'm, I'm going to be different. And it'll get easier and easier to stop as time goes on until it goes away. So you're doing it the right way. And you're probably doing it at the right time. And once you get over this fear, you'll find your life will be a lot better. And then you get to work on the next one. And <laughs> that's life. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Tom. You're welcome.